Not quite there yet. <laughs> Okay, you are ready to go now. Thank you very much. Um, uh, welcome everybody to the special meeting of council for July 13, 2021. And we acknowledge we are gathering today on the traditional territory of the Squamish Nation. Uh, before we approve the, the um, uh, agenda, um, I would like to add a couple of things to it. Uh, number one, I, usually with special meetings, we don't have an inquiry section. Uh, it's simply because it, uh, they are outside the scope, but that should only be, in my view, the second inquiry section. The first inquiry section should be included on the agenda because it relates to the business of the town and gives anybody the opportunity to ask questions about items that are on the agenda. And that's the purpose of the first inquiry section. So I would like to add a first inquiry section today and that'll come under, come as item three and uh, they will consequentially renumber the items as well. Um, secondly, I would like to add a um, uh, piece of new business and we don't have new business on this agenda either. So, uh, but I'd like to add um, information about uh, discussing um, risk uh, mitigation relative to fire uh, risk at this time. Uh, so that uh, council is going to be away for August this and next week is our only opportunity to discuss that. And we are at it uh, close to being extreme in terms of the fire um, assessment. And I'd just like to um, talk about that briefly and more to come next week on that. So, so if we could add that, and I guess the appropriate place to add that might be as a, um, 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 I'd like to add it early because I think Chief Michaels is going to join us. So if we, if we could add it as a, uh, um, it's not correspondence, although I could write it. I did, I did send an email. So we could put it under correspondence uh, an email that I sent to Rebecca. Uh, let's make it 3.3. And let's just say um, um, a fire, uh, fire mitigation, a risk mitigation plan um, and, and put that under that. And uh, as I mentioned to you before we're on air, um, Stafford Lumley, Councillor Lumley will not be joining us. He is in Penticton uh, today. Uh, so that, unless there's any other changes to the agenda, um, um, I would uh, like a motion to adopt the agenda as amended. Councillor Kroll, thank you. Councillor Dindrad, thank you. Uh, all in favor of adoption? Thank you very much. Um, this is a special council meeting. And um, as I say that uh, we try to limit this and we're doing this because we are planning and hoping to take much of August off. Uh, for those of us who are gonna be here, there, you never know when we might need to call us to order. So um, the first item on the agenda, well, we did uh, provide for inquiry and I don't know if there's anybody in the, uh, in the, um, in the room uh, as attendees who might wish to make an inquiry relative to the agenda. Uh, I, I see Ed Panoa is there. He's going to speak on item 3.2, which is the Dempster Field. And Rob Michaels is there. I don't know if anybody else would like to speak at all on um, any other or ask any question relative to the agenda. Please make yourself known to the corporate officer. If anyone is wishing to address council, please raise your hand. I see no hands raised, Mayor Beamish. Okay, thank you. Uh, we'll go then to item 3.1, which is the uh, Laurel Nash, Assistant Deputy Minister of Environmental Protection. In your agenda package is some correspondence relating to this issue. Um, I guess my concern, council, is I'd like to acknowledge the email from, uh, uh, that we received from the Deputy Minister. Uh, I'd like to go um, to acknowledge it in a way that uh, is not just a thank you for your letter. I feel that um, what I feel in this case is that um, we deserve some recognition by the ministry as parties of interest in the aquifer and in what happens on the aquifer recharge area. And um, in the letter, they suggest that the 
Upon completion of our inspection, the results will be posted to the public facing natural resource compliance and enforcement database. Suggesting mildly that we access the bio database to find the results of their investigation. I'd like to be able to, uh, with council's agreement, write a letter back and saying that uh, I feel that they should notify us of the results of their investigation directly uh, because the potential to impact our aquifer, uh, to be aware of things that are happening in our aquifer is very important. And we shouldn't have to go looking for that information uh, on a public facing database uh, at some time in the future when they get it posted. Um, you'll note that in my email to them earlier, uh, to Mr. Carnes on June 29th, I specifically requested that uh, uh, because they had indicated they were going to come here and do an investigation, I specifically requested, requested they work with the Chief Administrative Officer Mark Brown and with CAO Dean McKinley and provide any information about this issue and the status of the investigation to them directly. Uh, when the site visit and conducted to arrange to immediately uh, meet with our staff, uh, while the environmental compliance and enforcement staff are in the community to inform them what was found on the site and what the next steps in the investigation might be, and to confirm that you've received the communication. While well, they have confirmed they've received the communication, where well, they haven't confirmed that they are going to inform us or work with our staff, other than we go to look for it on a database at some time in the future, which I don't think is satisfactory. So uh, with, um, uh, and, and there's more happening, I, you know, I appreciate the, um, the, the work that, uh, that uh, Margot Grant is doing relative to looking at this area, this outside of our jurisdiction uh, area. We don't have the ability to wander around public property, private property, looking for things. Um, uh, I understand that it was uh, hikers who brought this to attention. Uh, I appreciate that. Uh, I appreciate the citizen science participation in this saying, hey, there's issues happening here. It should be looked at bringing it to the attention of the ministry, getting a response from the ministry, uh, which is something that uh, we sometimes don't achieve. Uh, but now that, that we're aware of it and the ministry is aware of it, uh, it is on our aquifer. And uh, I believe that we have to continue to follow up and work with the ministry to get this resolved. Um, I got a further email from Margot Grant today uh, relative to the Gilmore pit in terms of the um, things happening up there. So they're, they're taking an interest in this. Something we can't do directly, but I appreciate that. Councilor Dandrad. Thank you, Mayor. Uh, did we get an answer from UBCM whether we are meeting with the ministry or not? Oh, we don't get that for quite a while. Uh, that, oh, that, okay. that, that, you know, we, we, submit our, we submit our requests and the ministry sorts through those and decides which one they will respond to. So they, but we okay. do request to meet with staff. That, that's for me, the important one, you know, we'll be meeting with them, but we will meet with them at UBCM. Oh, we will? Okay. That, that, that request, uh, we haven't been able to submit that request yet for staff. Okay, so, okay. so perhaps just uh, to include this letter and ask the, and, and tell them that we are meeting with staff and we also request uh, uh, mm -hmm. a meeting and that we would like this to be added to the subject. I think it's important to, to follow up, right? Not just uh, ask them to give us uh, the, the results, but to follow up because I understand that this is something you're gonna be pursuing for a long time. Yeah. Councilor Kroll. Um, thank you, Mayor Beamish. Um, I, I would also suggest I, I totally agree with the follow up to the, the minister that, um, you know, they should be reporting back to the parties concerned and not just us. You mentioned the regional district and also the district of Seashell because they're also dependent on the, the potential water source with the church road well and um, for anything to be compromised because of, you know, negligence on the part of anyone would. Um, so I think if, if the minister hears back from all three or include the, uh, by all means, include the, the Seashell Nation as well, because they also receive water from the regional district. Well, I did conclude the Squamish Nation in the original uh, letter email uh, because it's uh, uh, contamination on which is uh, on their land, the traditional territory. lands. Yeah. Councillor Ludwig. 
Well, obviously I support this entirely. I just I have to point out that this seems to be a reoccurring theme with the provincial government that we seem to be, uh, the consultation between them and municipalities seems to be lacking. And I, I think we need to point it out again. Same with their Ministry of Highways, sometimes Ministry of Housing. So, I mean, I, I'm not sure what's going on here and why we're not considered a, a standing referral like we should be, but yeah. uh, make this a, a broader issue and really highlight this as an example. It's not just a standing referral. We are an order of government. And we should thank be doing government to government and, and, and have that respect in that way. So, so thank you very much. You will draft, I'll draft that in concert with the uh, CAO and the corporate officer and get that response out to them. But I just wanted to bring it to council's attention and to the public attention that this is a matter of concern for us. It's one of those things that we said that was a priority to us in our strategic plan and in our campaign that uh, the aquifer, protection of the aquifer, it's a struggle, uh, and this is the kind of response we are continually facing that we have to push back against. So thank you for that. And again, thank you to Margo Grant for bringing that to the public attention. Thank you. Okay, um, do we need, I don't believe, uh, Corporate Officer, we need a resolution. Uh, it's, it it is, will just be a, a responder to, but uh, um, uh, well, I'll just uh, take a motion to receive all the correspondence. Uh, on that, um, uh, Councillor Kroll, Councillor Ladwig, thank you. And then we will respond uh, in kind with the, uh, in terms of the conversation we just had. So thank you. Next item is the Sunshine Coast Baseball Association, the Dempster batting cage and um, corporate officer, Mr. Pinot is in the audience. I'd like you to raise him if you would please. And um, what we wanna talk about here is the batting cage uh, completion. Um, they have a budget of about $21,000, I believe, to complete the batting cage. We have a reserve of, of $21,929 is the amount. Ed, welcome. You can unmute yourself there, please. And um, we have a reserve of, uh, I'm informed by the uh, uh, our um, director of finance of $14,000. It was put in place when the batting cage that was adjacent to the RCMP station was taken down. And, um, and Ed uh, here is uh, representing the Sunshine Coast Baseball Association. And uh, so one of the requests I would make to council today is that the, that reserve be released. It has to be released by resolution uh, to the um, association. Uh, and the council may wish to consider adding additional funds to it um, and uh, to meet the $21,000 budget, um, uh, the um, director of finance doesn't identify a specific source of that. Although there are a couple of sources that uh, the association could look at. One is to apply for the $1,000 grant, uh, the COVID grant, because they are a nonprofit and they would be eligible to apply to us for the COVID grant that we put out there. And the other is to look at our um, um, grants of assistance, which is the next intake date is September uh, to add to their funding. And uh, the maximum on that is $2,000. So depending where they are with their fundraising, but uh, Ed uh, brought to my attention some significant economic benefit that town uh, relates to this. And Ed, perhaps you speak to that if you wouldn't mind and welcome. Thank you. Thank you, Mayor. Thank you, councillors, uh, for your time. So just for this weekend, in, for an example, we had uh, a baseball uh, team from Coquitlam come out and uh, they rented 13 rooms from the Cedar Inn. Um, they came up on Saturday, stayed for overnight and, and left on Sunday. But during that time, there were parents, there were kids, coaches, um, dining out, you know, like all the facilities were being used. Uh, a lot of spending was being done. We're, what we're anticipating with, with the, um, the resurgence of baseball on the Sunshine Coast uh, is that we can hold some tournaments here on the, on the Dempster Field as well as Brothers Field, um, bring some people over, have some, um, some parents and kids take, a, take advantage of our facilities, of our dining, of our, of our hospitality, bring some business over to the, the local businesses and neighborhood pubs and, and whatnot. Um, so it would be, in our mind, an economic boost and a, and a good investment in the infrastructure to um, to have the batting cage 
brought to where it was before. And the Sunshine Coast Baseball Association itself has is, is put in almost $10,000 into uh, field maintenance for the Dempster field itself. And we'll continue to do so to bring that up to a level of uh, playing field that we can all be proud of and that uh, would attract some of the, the, uh, the better teams and, and, and uh, from the lower mainland to come and play here rather than perhaps go to Kamloops. Um, Kamloops is, is renowned for their, for their baseball and their tournaments and, and there's no reason in the world why we can't do that here. We have the facilities, we, we're a much nicer area in my opinion. Um, so, you know, we could certainly bring an economic boon to the, to the area because of, of sports. Um, and this year, in particular, the resurgence is likely because of COVID, but we can build upon that. We've had 156 kids register to play baseball this year, and that's well in excess of what we've had in the past. And, and there seems to be parents in the stands and, and just bystanders in the stands like on this, uh, this past Sunday. There were people who have absolutely no affiliation with the kids, but sitting in the stands watching baseball again. And that's just, that's great to see. We're very happy to see that. Thank you, Ed. Yeah, uh, we have, what do we have in Brothers Park? Do we have four diamonds? Would they, would all four be suitable for that kind of ball? Uh, we have three diamonds at, three diamonds at Brothers. Um, two of them would be suitable for that kind of ball. The the third could be, you know, if we were having a, a large tournament, let's say, it would, wouldn't take a much to to build a pitching mound. Other than that, that's, that's all it is. And you can actually, we could actually together <laughs> buy a portable pitching mound. And, and that takes care of it. And you can just pick it up and put it back in the sea can and lock it away when it's, when it's not yeah. needed. Yeah. Yeah. I know that there are communities and you say the interior that they, that's, they build quite a tourism from around the uh, baseball tournaments and the proximity Absolutely. we have to the lower mainland is, uh, is, would be great for something like that. So, yeah. Mm -hmm. Agreed. Uh, so thank you for, for that. And uh, first of all, Council, I'd like, I'd like to ask for a resolution to release the $14,000 available from the General Reserve uh, to the Sunshine Coast Baseball Association for the batting cage uh, replacement at Dempster Field. Councillor Ladwig, thank you. Councillor Kroll, any discussion of that, Council? Councillor Kroll? Thank you, Mayor Beamish. Um, it, it just something sort of anecdotal years ago, um, I think most people know I did property management and one of the families I rented property to was the Dempster family. And they rented a property on um, Reed Road, which was, had five acres. And Ryan's dad created his a field of dreams for his son. And um, wow. that commitment by his father has certainly paid off with the success of Ryan and how he's, um, you know, contributed to the, the to the community. So, um, you know, and it's just an example of, um, you know, fostering sports in the community. So, certainly in support of this. Councillor Ludwig, and then, then Councillor Deandre. Yeah, first of all, I just wanted to say I, I really appreciated your letter, Ed. I, I thought it was really well written and well presented. Yeah. Um, uh, as a mother of two young children, they don't happen to be in baseball, they're in the dance realm. But I mm -hmm. well the importance of uh, sports and activities for young families here in, in Gibsons and in any small town. We don't have a lot of the big attractions that a bigger, bigger urban center has. And so um, being active in sports is a big part of our lives. So I fully support what you guys are doing and, and I love you for fundraising. Thank you. Councilor Dean Dredd. Thank you, Mayor. Uh, yeah, uh, I mirror everybody's uh, feedback and I appreciate uh, Ed, that you mentioned about the economic because obviously uh, we need to appeal for the economy, but I think more than anything, this kind of sports build community. And especially what we have been through lately and, and also the fact that the Sunshine Coast is a, a sports nation. Our kids excel in so many sports. This is really welcome. I would uh, support fully, you know, any incentive. I love the idea of the extra grant and perhaps the, the, the grant of assistance. And then the funds will be almost matched and uh, this is very important to keep supporting and keeps the kids because our kids go a lot somewhere else, but it's important that they, they feel proud that our communities support them to in this regard providing facilities so fully support. Thank you. Thank you. 
I'll call the question on the motion then. Uh, all in favor? Thank you. Uh, secondly, um, I think that Ed, if you, the, the grants of assistance and the additional grant, the $1,000 COVID grant are things you can apply for directly. Uh, were you looking at doing some additional fundraising for the balance, which would be about $5,000 on, on your estimate right now, or what's your thoughts? Absolutely. We, we will continue to fundraise to, to get to our, 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 um, our needed goal to, to get the batting cage back to where it was and beyond, actually. So for sure, um, we'll apply for the grants and, and continue to fundraise. If you could keep us informed, we, we will. I mean, the grants should be... Uh, I mean, the, the $1,000 doesn't require a resolution. That can be approved by staff. The $2,000 would require a resolution at some time in the future. Uh, but if you could keep us informed and feel free to come back to us and say that, you know, uh, that uh, you're short of your goal and, uh, and uh, additional assistance is required, we'll take a look at that as well. I encourage you to do awesome. that. I would Thank like you. to give Appreciate the community it. an opportunity to contribute. Okay. Thank you very Thank much. You. Thank you. Thank you, Council. Okay, the next item, uh, 3.3, which I added to the agenda, it's just one of awareness of uh, where we are at this time in the, um, in the season and in the weather. It's extremely dry. Um, perhaps, um, um, Corporate Officer, if you could uh, raise uh, Rob Michael, uh, please, to the, to the meeting. Um, what, is, what I'm concerned about is that uh, we need to create a consistent awareness within the community of the risk of fire. Now we are a community that does not permit uh, uh, burning or beach fires, uh, unlike the other the rest of the regional district, although they are now banned. Um, Rob, you can, you're muted there, I saw you there, there you are. Thanks, thank you, welcome, Chief. Uh, thank you for joining us. At short notice too, I appreciate. Um, I went around to the three accesses to the English Trail today. Uh, and one of the thing that I note is uh, the English Trail access on Shaw Road, there's a proliferation of signs. Um, and the, the, um, there is a very small sign that says no smoking. Actually, it's just, it's just the circle with a, across a cigarette. Um, and, um, and, but it's very minor. Uh, there is the one that says no fires, which is consistent with the town. I would like to see us in those high risk areas, whether it's in, in um, the access to the English Trail or the um, uh, White Tower Park or to other areas, be much more specific at this time of year in terms of that fire risk. And that just means making more signs and those signs be very specific. Um, Chief Michaels and I spoke today. They are going to, um, Chief is going to be presenting his quarterly report next week and we'll have more to say about this. But, but in terms of a, a sign that stands out, whether it's red and white uh, and um, identifies the, both the fire risk is right now it's high, tomorrow it could be extreme. It's that we're that, on the cusp of that. Uh, but we just need to be aware of that. I, th I don't th think we're at the point in Gibson's of closing trails, but certainly creating an awareness of, uh, of the risks and uh, making sure that, I mean, Port Coquitlam, people lighting candles on the trails. I mean, what is this? You know, that uh, 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 walkers finding lit candles in the bush. Um, so it's at some stage we have to create that awareness of even fire prevention fire walks, but there's also with the contractors using equipment and equipment can often just like a train driving by can create sparks and create a fire. So making sure there's fire watch uh, on contract sites where heavy equipment is being used and other things. I see one building having a torch on roof applied right now. Those require fire and uh, often they can result in fire. So, uh, but I'd really like to create a high awareness of this. Well, I'll let Chief Michael speak before, before council. Chief. Thank you, uh, Mayor. Um, I think that you are raising a, a good discussion topic at this time. It is top of mind for many, um, but not enough for others. You know, I, I like to think that we are dealing with reasonable people and they're taking the appropriate cautions, but as you alluded to with the candles inside the forest that are being lit and left, and the fact that the fire department is still attending illegal fires and issuing fines uh, demonstrates that that's not entirely the case. 
I am excited that uh, the fire department and uh, the Sunshine Coast Regional District Emergency Program have just brought on some additional staff. Uh, the Jordan Pratt Deputy Fire Chief has started last week and he works in the fire department for three days a week and in the emergency program for two days a week, uh, creating one full-time position. Um, so that's very top of mind and very timely for, uh, for project work for, for uh, this valuable resource. Um, you know, and, and I'm, I'm encouraged by the list that I'm writing down here just to see, you know, what it is that we are doing, um, recognizing that there's gaps and there's a long way to go. Um, you know, and some of the things that we can do are on the other side of that. So as you discussed, closing parks or trails, I would consider that to be an extreme measure. And I'm really hopeful that we don't need to go in that direction. Um, you know, we, we do rely a lot on BC Wildfire Service and their expertise. Um, a lot of science goes in behind the decisions that they're making and uh, it's really tangible. And so we, we do rely on, on that advice. So once we start seeing area closures um, in, in the coastal fire center, uh, I think the hairs on the back of our necks will st stand out just a little bit as we um, start determining some next steps. Um, in 2019, I believe it was uh, quite recently, um, the uh, Sunshine Coast Regional District uh, was successful in a grant application for um, from UBCM for, I wanna get this name right here, um, the Volunteer and Composite Fire Department Equipment and Training Grant. Uh, 25,000 of that $100,000 grant was uh, specifically for the Gibsons Fire Department. And the, the theme of that report um, or that re uh, grant request was uh, wildfire preparedness and resiliency. So, um, members, uh, volunteer members have been issued uh, wildland coveralls and equipment and uh, some training, which also goes hand in hand with um, the structure protection unit trailer that was uh, donated uh, by the community forest in the care of the Seashell Fire Department. Uh, again, a good amount of cooperation has been going into um, to that uh, resource. Um, it was brought over by uh, the assistant chief of training just a short while ago and and our members were able to tear it apart use it for a training night and return it um so i i, I am seeing a lot of good things uh happening but uh, i think keeping this conversation going um is right so I, we're happy to speak more about this as well uh at next week's meeting or i can answer any uh burning questions that we have at this time if there are any burning questions councillor lightweight then councillor the Good fun there. <laughs> um, I was just wondering if um, any of us uh, had any information on activities that are likely to cause wildfires, like the train, for example. I wouldn't have thought of that, but until you actually experience it, and then it makes sense. So I, I just feel like a lot of people are aware of the, the no-brainers, um, the things that are obvious, but it's the other activities that I'm more concerned about. So like Mayor Beamish mentioned, some of the, you know, construction activities, um, a train going by, like what are, like I'm wondering if we've done much research on, on these other types of activities that can cause risk. Chief? That's, yeah, that's a, that's a great question. And again, I, I really am so hopeful that we are dealing with reasonable people here. And I do have a fairly high degree of confidence in some of those contract crews. A really good example of, of one that I come across is um, the grass clearing along the highway. And when the danger rating gets to extreme, uh, they have a threshold that, you know, they have to stop using that equipment. And it's a really tough one because we want to get rid of the fuels on the side of the highway. Um, we want you know, there to be that, that bit of a fire break, but it, at a certain point it gets too dry and too hot and they voluntarily shut down operations. Um, in addition, one of my volunteer members just reached out to me today and says, hey, I'm working down at the, the log sort here and um, I might be going on a layoff pretty quick just due to uh, forestry firefighting concerns. And they'll, you know, I think they're making hard but reasonable decisions, right? Even if there's a, an economic impact to, to that organization. So, you know, um, it, it, it's, it's tough because you're, you're right. It, there could be that, that unintended 
unintended um, incident that can that can cause a, a major event. It's not my job to undersell risk in our community, but you know I don't see Lytton or Fort McMurray happening on the Sunshine Coast. Our fuels are different, um, our climate's much different, right? Our, our humidity is much higher than it is in the Okanagan right now. Um, so you know we can rest it a little bit, but you know still having appropriate precautionary measures uh, is is the right mind frame for us, right? You know not throwing our cigarette butts out the window. I mean, at any time, but, you know, especially now, um, you know, being really mindful of our power tools and chainsaws and other equipment, um, you know, and having those backup plans in place or having water supplies or extinguishment tools nearby are, are really important nowadays as well. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Councilor Dean Thank you, Mayor. Thank you, uh, Chief Michael. Uh, I. I think my biggest concern is with the distraction factor, right? The person that threw a cigarette. And I wonder how much the, the Sunshine Coast, and this is actually perhaps even for uh, our own council, we can invest in communication. I, when I come back from uh, the Vancouver, I don't remember, I think because I live here, I don't remember if we have extra uh, you know, in the visitor center, right at the top of the, the bypass, if we can have some, not the regular is just high, but some other attention factor, right? Perhaps some sort of even brochures, so like just one paper distributed. I don't know if the ferry can do some so sort of partnership, but I think these two months are crucial. People need to wake up and sometimes an extra uh, wake up like that. It help us. It, it, it's a campaign we have to do because the accidents that we see, I mean, beside the, the train that it was a different, like you said, a different uh, situation. The, the accident, we all know that most accidents happen with just people being distracted. And uh, I, I don't know if uh, Chief is aware that Oregon actually passed a, a legislation that people cannot smoke in the car anymore. So, I mean, I think this is something that should come in the future for us, but what can we do in terms, in, in, in terms of communication that really brings a, 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 a higher level of awareness to our community? Perhaps this is also a way to, you know, not only visitors, but also our own, own community, because, right? So that's my suggestion. Yeah, I, I think that's well received. You know, I, uh, I'm not a communications expert by any means, but I, I do know that, um, you know, I, I am an SCRD function, right, and um, work with uh, Aidan Buckley in communications at the regional district, and he's got some really neat ideas and wants to, you know, showcase some of the smaller fire department responses and events and promote that awareness. But I, I also understand that there is a, a working relationship between the town and the SCRD and other local governments as well. So I, I think um, having that team get creative and, and come up with some things is, is a good idea. Um, and we'd be supportive of that. Uh, I mean, the last, um, um, one of the last instances that I had uh, where we issued a, a fine was right directly underneath uh, a no fire sign, which is really disheartening, right? And it's probably one of the most common things that I hear. So more signage is needed, more signage is needed. And, and you know, sometimes it's deliberate where the signs are pulled off as using as uh, materials to burn with, right? It's, it's absolutely crazy that these sort of activities occur. But, um, you know, I, <laughs> if, you, if we keep doing the same thing, Right, we'll expect the same results. So I'm I'm happy to to try some additional outreach strategies. Um, I, I, you know, keeping my keeping my ear to the ground on on how to do that a little bit. I've just reactivated the Gibson's Fire Department Twitter account as an example, and I'm not really um, not really sure how to use that tool yet. But you know, um, more communication rather than less is is probably warranted. Councilor Kroll. Thank you, Mayor Beamish, and thank you, Chief Michaels. Um, you know, one of the thing, you know, I think, you know, we live in a community and we have grave concern when you see something like Linton happen. Um, past fires that we've had here on the coast, um, you know, we have been fortunate. Sometimes they've been early in the season and Airspan still had their resources on the coast and were able to hit the fires 
fast and hard and that resource now is elsewhere. So, you know, I, I totally agree. The education thing is really important. And, you know, Mayor Beamish referenced uh, construction equipment. I've been up in, um, you know, just on some of the hiking trails and an ATV will go by and, you know, th throw rocks that um, cause sparks. So it's not just construction equipment, even a mountain bike can do it. Um, people really need to be vigilant. And um, I think, you know, I don't know if anyone ever really listens to announcements on BC ferries, but I think as much as you can saturate the market that you're coming into a vulnerable community. You know, we had the vulnerability with COVID and now we've got it um, more so with fire because um, we've got some huge things stacked against us if we ever did have a major fire on the coast. So, uh, you know, I think anything we can do to um, advertising, you know, as you say, I know on Ocean Beach Esplanade, um, residents have put up signs and they've been torn down and burned, as you say. So it's, um, it's, it's, it's a bit frustrating, but um, perhaps just cooperation between the municipalities, the districts, the BC ferries, tourism, um, the Airbnb platforms, just get the word out that you're, you, you know, you're in a dangerous community and hopefully, um, you know, we, we can get the word out. Yeah, thank you. And thank you all. I mean, my intention today was just to kind of raise awareness uh, of this issue and to, then to look for, to our staff and to the fire department to look for things uh, that can be done to create an awareness, ongoing awareness in the community. And uh, we'll look for perhaps that conversation next week when the uh, deputy chief presents the quarterly report and maybe more information on that. And if there's signage uh, solutions that we can assist with and uh, that makes sense to put signage up, the, the awareness uh, of the fire risk on the coast as people arrive on the coast, keeping that high in mind. I'm aware of the, um, the, the grass that has been cut on the boulevards and continues to lay there and how, how dry and crispy that has become and uh, very vulnerable to, a, to a, a cigarette. So we have to be very cautious in that uh, so that um, we'll look for that. We want to have a safe summer. We want to have a good summer and uh, we want to be a community that can help other communities as opposed to being looking for help. So I really appreciate that. So Chief, thank you for short notice and joining us today. Thank right. you very much. Thank you. Um, yeah, I, I don't know there's any action out of that. I had initially said that uh, we'd ask staff to prepare a, a plan, but I'd like to wait until we see what the discussion next week from the fire department is. But Councilor Deandre, go ahead. Well, I was actually going to ask about the mitigation plan and I, I feel a little bit of sense of urgency, right? Because it's almost like a week from today. So I won't. Okay. Yeah, I, I, don't, I think it's important, for example, we have a communication officer. I don't know, do we need to make uh, our, our CAO as well, if they can start a dialogue? Because things that I thought, even as, as we are talking, and then there's this fellow that have incredible ideas, perhaps even uh, we are not putting posters like, uh, sorry, uh, big signs, but maybe when people go to IGA, maybe, maybe the stores would carry some sign. And I, uh, maybe we, we do this uh, kind of a... Uh, uh, dialogue with sports club, you know, the, the, the teenagers, so anything that they can think about it. I just, because we are in the middle, we, we're not in March, right? We're in July already. So I'm just, uh, if we have to do something, we should tackle. My, my note uh, to um, staff at uh, Rebecca and Mark was that um, I request staff prepare a plan to mitigate the fire risk in the town, including public information, contract awareness, uh, closing high-risk trail access, monitoring high-risk areas by regular visitor patrols, and other action necessary, including consistent signage. That's what I was looking for in terms of actions we could take, uh, okay. potentially take as we escalate the concerns. Yeah. Um, may, may you include the word outreach, community outreach? Yeah, sure. Community, community other, outreach uh, awareness. We target many, many sources at once. Councillor Kroll? Um, I would certainly recommend that we extend that on um, the staff liaise with the regional district as well, because fire doesn't know any boundaries. Yep, I agree. I agree. Yeah. And uh, a note from um, the uh, CAO says that quite pre prepared to work with Chief Michael 
uh, Chief Michaels, Mac Trite, and Elizabeth to help with communication. So, uh, Councillor Ludwig. Yeah, I support everything that you said there, except for the closing of the trails at this point. I, yeah. I, well, it's part of the mitigation plan. And at what point would we do that? I guess that's the question. Yeah, okay. and, and looking at that. Right now, as I Chief mentioned to me today, we are at high risk. We could shortly be at extreme risk. And uh, are there things we need to do, uh, consider as risk heightens uh, in the community? So, um, yeah, if, if, uh, if council is in agreement with that, at least we can um, ask staff to look at those items and report back to us next week as to what, uh, what is possible. Um, someone second that as a motion. Uh, I've got it written out. Councillor D'Andrade, I'll take your second. So, okay, so any further discussion? Yeah, all in favor? Thank you. Yeah, I appreciate that. I, it, as I say, it, uh, these are the things that, uh, you know, we once asked uh, uh, Daniel what keeps him awake at night, and it was the uh, Prouse Road lift station. Well, these are the things that keep us awake at night, uh, worrying about the overall protection of the community, and, and those are things that uh, we can have some influence on too late after the fact. So thank you. Um, carrying on with the agenda then, uh, we'll go to uh, bylaws and we have a wildlife attraction bylaw and we have a report, uh, a big report um, from the bylaw enforcement officer and planner titled wild law attraction bylaw number 1294 2021 community feedback and a motion to be received. So, um, and Katie, are you speaking to this? <laughs> Uh, yes, please. I have a yep. quick introduction. Thank you. Um, so the draft wildlife attractant bylaw number 1294 and the corresponding amendments to the garbage and organics collection and disposal bylaw and the bylaw enforcement notice bylaw were first presented um, to the committee of the whole back in um, April. I think it was April 20th. Um, Council gave each bylaw first reading and then um, directed staff to provide an opportunity for public feedback. The town received 49 responses between April the 20th and May the 26th. And of those 55% or 26 individuals supported the bylaw as presented. We had 25% or 12 respondents who opposed the introduction of the removal of bird feeders during the bear season and 14% or seven individuals who were opposed to maintaining and storing fruit bearing plants in such a manner so as not to attract wildlife. Um, and those who commented on this had stated that they thought that the proposed regulation would discourage residents from growing their own food. Um, so staff have amended the wildlife attractant bylaw to remove the limitations on bird feeders during the summer as we have um, something in our property maintenance bylaw number um, 780 that states that fallen, um, remove fallen bird feed and not scatter or place bird feed so as to attract terrestrial wildlife and ensure that any bird feeder contra um, containing bird feed is suspended on a cable or other device in such a manner that it is inaccessible to terrestrial wildlife. So we thought we'd just leave that in that bylaw and not a duplicate. Um, so the bylaw enforcement notice amendment bylaw, which is 112512, has been amended to remove the associated fines for bird feeders. And there's no change to the garbage and organics collection disposal amendment bylaw number 125204. Now it should be noted that the bylaw enforcement in the town usually begins with a um, education first approach and staff plan to develop a brochure for residents to learn about the bylaw and ways to limit attractants on private property. So um, staff recommend giving the bylaws first, uh, I mean, second and third reading um, and moving these forward. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, council, questions? Council Dean Thank you, Mayor. Uh, yeah, uh, the report is great. Uh, I think, uh, the, the feedback we take it. I think I have one concern with regards to the to the feeding of uh, birds because I didn't even know that the property maintenance by law had this <laughs> clauses. 
And I think people would go direct straight to the wildlife attractant and seeds obviously are an attractant and not having anything mentioned on the wildlife attracted by, uh, at, well, life, sorry, I forgot the name, <laughs> attracted by law. I think it, 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 it's a mistake because the only, and just to be clear, we are not prohibiting people to feed the birds. We are just telling them feed with, uh, with the guidelines that we, we, we should post, we should uh, insert into the bylaw. I don't mind the duplication. I think it's very important because I frankly have to say, I wasn't aware of this bylaw <laughs> and I have a property in Gibson's. I never looked, but I would have looked the wildlife attractant bylaw. So we are not prohibiting people, but I think we should have a, a, a clause because this is actually the only wildlife that we are allowing to be fed in Gibson's. Mm -hmm. So to have uh, 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 the, the bylaw without the mentioning, I, I find that it doesn't make sense. So I wouldn't mind having these two clauses in, inserted in the bylaw and even suggesting that them that they can uh, uh, remove the, 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 I mean, depending on the, the, the bird feeder, you can remove at night, right? Or, or late evening. So I think it's important to have this precautionary approach. So that's my suggestion that we, we insert this in the bylaw and be clear that we are not prohibiting people uh, feeding the birds, but feeding appropriately. Katie, do you want to respond to that? Uh, we, we can do that if, if um, council, if council feel, feel strongly about it because, because it's already in a bylaw. Um, there's also there's a um, fine that's already attached to that, um, and it would be something that when we develop that brochure, we'd probably add about bird feeders um, in the bright brochure. So whether or not it's not in the bylaw itself, it would be in the um, it would be in the public education um, brochure. Mm -hmm. Other councilors, Council Ludwig. Council I thought we talked about taking poultry out of this. Did we discuss that? I'm sorry, go ahead. Sorry, I thought we talked about taking poultry out of this bylaw. I think we did mention that at one time, did we? But I still see it in there. There's it's, no poultry to be oh. kept on the property after zoning bylaw 1065. It's, uh, it's still in there because there was no resolution about it. Um, our zoning bylaw prohibits um, any other, I think it's other than house um, pets um, in, in the town. So you can have poultry on agriculturally zoned properties, but not in um, residential properties. And at the moment, they're seen as an attractant. I take it there are some grandfathered properties in town because there are some properties with poultry um, and uh, that we're not enforcing on them. Is that correct? There are a couple, for instance, Marina House um, on Marine Drive has, has been grandfathered because that was, that was in there before um, that the stipulation came into the zoning bylaw. And the house of Corlett and North Fletcher? Yeah. Uh, I can't speak to that one. Okay. Sue's unfortunately not here today, but she okay. might be able to speak to that one. Yeah. My recollection of the conversation was that we recognize that it could be an attraction, I had stated that I felt I'd like to see it treated the same as fruit trees or garbage where they'd have to be responsible with their, it'd have to be a bear resistant um, facility or storage unit or whatever you want to call it. But I thought we kind of agreed, but maybe we didn't make a resolution on it just to remove it for now um, because it is in another bylaw and that that leaves it open to um, revisiting the whole backyard chicken discussion at a later date, if we chose to get into that at a later date, um, as opposed yeah, to having that. Makes sense. I, I, I don't recall a resolution on it myself, but as I say, I, I do recall you raised it at the time as a question. Yeah. Um, how would you like to deal with that? Just because, as you say, it does exist in the zoning bylaw, is it, uh, or is it where else? Yeah. Yeah. It's, in, it's in our zoning bylaw right now. Yeah. Uh, so 
do we need to have it in this bylaw as well? We don't. We don't have to. We can. We can remove that if you'd like to. Councilor Andrade, see your hand. Thank you. I think it's the same issue, right? I mean, we are asking our public to go in different places to understand about wildlife attracted. I th I would like to see everything in one bylaw. It doesn't matter if it's a repeat. It's better to repeat than yeah. than don't have and expect that the public would go to three different sources to understand a bylaw. Yeah. And so then we mentioned the. And then when we mention we mention the bylaw to tourists, it's also easy for them. They can pull in and understand. And then it could be evident that we are allowing uh, 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 bird feeding, but with precaution. So, as long as there is consistency between the bylaws, and yeah. when we amend one, we have to consequentially amend the other. That's often what happens. They get out of sync, and we have to look at those consequential amendments. So that uh, I know the regional districts is having a struggle right now with uh, some work they're doing, not realizing the scope of the consequential amendments they had to 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 amend and uh, they, that they hadn't thought about at the time. So, but yeah, so I what's council's wishes, um, uh, Councilor Ludwig? All right, I'll I'll leave it for now. Um, and I mean, really, what it comes down to is. I'd like to open up the conversation about backyard chickens yeah. and food security and encouraging yeah. that as a small community. And I think there's ways of doing it responsibly. Um, I grew up in a community where that was a big part of where I lived and it was great. So, but maybe for the time being, um, we'll just leave it and, uh, and recognize that if we get to that point, then we just have to revisit all these little bylaws and change it, I guess, if that's happened. Okay, so leave chickens in. Uh, but also add in the bird feeding um, of provisions. Yeah. Um, is it clear, do we need to see this again then with that, uh, with those changes or uh, are those, is that clear direction, Katie, for you? Yeah, that, that's clear for me. We can also have a resolution if you would like to um, revisit poultry um, to look at that. Um, get staff, direct staff to look into um, allowing for chickens on properties, residential properties in the town, and that would be a, that would be a separate, separate resolution. Motion, yeah. Councillor Ludwig, are we? When do we do our next? Do 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 we do an annual work planning session in the new year? We do that in the fall. In the fall. Yeah. Um, and the budget. Yeah. Okay, let's save it for then, Katie, and I'll think about it relative to our other priorities. So, in terms of the report, we have, uh, first of all, that uh, let's make a motion that the report be received. Um, Councillor Dindrad, Councillor Ladwick, thank you. All in favor, receipt. Thank you. Uh, and then that, um, um, now we are going to, the as amended, uh, in fact, we we took the bird feeder out of the bylaw. So if we leave it in, is it as amended or is it as amended and amended again? It would be different. So what we took out of the bylaw was um, to prohibit um, bird feeders from being placed on a property during the bear season. And I believe we said how we had stated that that was between April and I think the end of October. Um, so we would have to replace that with um, the section that's in the property maintenance bylaw. Um, so we would say that ensure that any bird feeder containing bird feed is suspended on a cable. Okay. Council comfortable with that further amendment? Council Dean Drad? I mean, I, I don't mind the way the, the property by law, maintenance by law, it, the way it's spelled. I think it's clear because the first is about removing falling bird feed and not scatter uh, the, the, the seeds, not to attract wildlife. So it is uh, uh, very explicit. And the second is also ensure the bird feeder containing. Bird feed is suspended on a cable. So I like the language, right? And, and perhaps we could have bird feed is allowed um, as long as something like that, <laughs> uh, and and I think it's explicit. I'll go to Katie first. 
The section um, 3.4 of the proposed bylaw talks about a person must not feed wildlife except for birds away from roadways and sidewalks. So I think um, a portion of what you're asking for there, Councillor DeAndre, is in there. So we can we can add both those sections from the um, property maintenance bylaw, which is to remove fallen bird feed and not scatter or place bird feed so as to attract wildlife. Um, and then ensure that any bird feeder containing bird feed is suspended on a cable or other device in a manner that is inaccessible to wildlife. Yeah. Yep. Okay. Uh, Councilor Kroll, you had something you wanted to say? Um, no, I'm, I'm fine for the moment, sir. It was just with respect to um, something that's coming up, the garbage collection and disposal. Okay. Well, then let's go then to um, um, the next resolution and, and that the wildlife attraction bylaw number 1294-2021 be given second and third reading as amended. Any council understands those amendments? Council, somebody wish to move that? Council Dean Drad, Councilor Kroll. Uh, further discussion of that? Uh, all in favor? Thank you. And um, now the garbage and organic collection disposal bylaw have been given further uh, be given second and third reading. Um, is there any discussion around that one? Okay, uh, seeing none, somebody care to move that? Councilor Kroll, sorry, you want to hear some discussion? Yeah, um, thank you, sir. Um, one of the things I've noticed, and um, you know, when you're dealing with wildlife being attracted to garbage, um, it doesn't take wildlife very long to figure out what days are garbage days. You know, I've driven to the ferry, you know, on garbage day along Marine Drive, and you can count the bears toppling garbage cans or raccoons in the families flipping garbage cans and pulling stuff out. Now, to that end, checking on available garbage cans that are relatively um, animal resistant, because I think a determined bear will probably find his way into something unless it's sort of like one of the cans we have on the main street or you see in provincial parks. Um, on page 58 of the um, material that was provided to us by the public, there's a screw on lid type garbage can. Those garbage cans, the cheapest I could find them were $100.71 each they weigh 18 pounds. So with our contract with AGM, our garbage collectors are only allowed to lift 50 pounds, which is with biweekly garbage collection, that's allowing a household 32 pounds of garbage, which would be lovely if it can be maintained at that between recycling and one thing and another, it's great. But I think, and also, um, it's gonna take a garbage collector longer to unscrew a lid or deal with a tamper-proof container to load the truck. So I think there's some considerations that we haven't really taken into consideration, like length of time to collect garbage. You've got a great big diesel truck belching, um, you know, fossil fuel emissions for a longer time. And is there gonna be a back charge to the community? Um, the garbage cans that like the regional district use that can be picked up by a truck that are animal resistant, they're $465 a piece um, for the animal resistant ones. So I, I think it, it's something that we need to be cognizant of, um, you know, wh what are other implications of, um, you know, some of the legislation we're bringing in. I guess, is it possible that the town could consider entering into some kind of a, a funding agreement with residents uh, to offset some of the costs of a upgrading garbage cans. Um, I know the regional district has done that from time to time on different uh, on different things. And I wonder if it, uh, the town would ever consider doing that. Councilor Kroll? Um, well, to that end, sir, we have um, 1,479 what are classified as single family homes. So 
at $100.71. That's $147,900. Um, this to provide those homes, which would be a 4.6 tax. Well, except we could apply for a grant for that. It yeah, it, it's, and, but it's a, the other thing I think we need to look at is, you know, um, and I tried to check with AJ, AJM um, to find out, you know, had they had any experience with the screw top cans and how much longer did it take? And the, the fact that they weigh 18 pounds, mm. which is quite a weight for a garbage can when you consider the age of the community. You know, so it's um, just something I wanted to raise as a potential concern. Um, there might be other there might be other alternatives out there as well. Councilor Deandra? Uh yeah, I appreciate what Councillor Crow is saying, but I, I'm supportive of a customized approach and I'll tell you the reason why. For example, I particularly I actually I'm not having I'm putting garbage every two months, I guess, because I, I basically don't have and I freeze all my any, any, any potential uh, animal thing, but obviously I don't have two kids, right? And I, uh, it's only two people. So, uh, and, and again, I can put uh, the garbage right before. So, mm -hmm. but you have, uh, I remember the, the discussion went around, for example, families with three, four young kids where they're using diapers and stuff. So if we do a customized approach, I think we help the people who need, right? Whether kids or seniors, people. So I, I would, would support some blending instead of establishing the whole town because frankly, I don't need, it will be extra and probably the garbage collector would have a relief because my can is really light. Yeah. So yeah. perhaps something like that. Yeah. Well, is there is there further amendments we need to make or the, right now the, um, uh, uh, we have opportunity for amending uh, the, the, the bylaw before us for, for reading, but is, there, is this an issue that we need to deal with right now or something we need to look forward to in the future? Uh, Katie? So the, uh, the um, garbage um, amendment that we're looking at is just for commercial and multifamily residential. We're not looking at, at um, single family residential homes at the moment. So that's just something to, to consider when we're looking at this bylaw amendment right now. In terms of the numbers of commercial and multifamily dwellings out there, how many are we talking about that will have to make major changes to comply with this? So it, it's, um, they wouldn't, no one that has an existing um, garbage facility would have to change it now, but it's going forward. We don't have any standards for a developer to build to when they're um, creating a, a garbage enclosure. So we wanted to have something when we when we talk to a developer at the development permit stage, um, we wanted a standard for them to be able to see and to be able to essentially plan into their site plan. Um, and it's something to consider. So, so our, when we're looking at a development, we know that they have ample storage space for right. their garbage because right. often you'll find that that's a, the last thing that you design on, on a site plan and it, it's not usually in the best position for collecting garbage or for um, making sure that it's, um, yeah. you know, it, it's not attracting wildlife. So mm -hmm. it, we, we wanted something there that, is easy for um, developers to find to see, and um, easy for the um, the building inspector to be able to sign off to. And then, if any new any, any existing uh, commercial or multi residential was looking for help in terms of what should they be doing, that that information would be available to them. But we're not going and enforcing against them right now. No, we we wouldn't enforce. So um, no, we wouldn't enforce anything. If it essentially they would be grandfathered in um, if they already have existing um, solid waste um, enclosures. And this, um, I think it's Schedule C on the um, on this bylaw. Um, it's from the um, 
resort municipality of Whistler and Squamish, the district of Squamish also use it. So it's, it's been proven to um, be effective. So um, um, we don't provide any dimensions. That's up to the developer and the size of the, um, the, the build. So, um, yeah. Okay. Well, thank you for that uh, clarification. Councilor Dindra? Uh, just something that I remember we, we had discussed in the past uh, with uh, SGRs, that they eventually they should have uh, some sign about uh, bear attractants, like uh, wildlife attractants in generally. So I don't know, do we need to make a motion? Uh, I'm just afraid that by the time we deal with SGRs, this is not included. And because we are dealing right now with the wildlife attraction bylaw, uh, that this should yeah. be included, uh, some sort of signage for the short-term rentals. I think I'd like to see that come up later in, in, as this is as a multifamily and, and commercial. But yeah, we, we could we'll certainly look at that. Uh, we shouldn't forget that opportunity. Yeah. Councilor Kroll? Um, just, no, and, and I don't know exactly the source of it, but something that was brought to my attention is um, the mall. They're, they get people, well, they had to move their dumpsters and lock them because residents were dumping stuff in them. Now what people are doing is taking their garbage into the mall and use, dropping it in the garbage cans in the mall. And I don't know exactly who it is. I know the mall's getting a little concerned about it. Um, because the cost of garbage is paid for by the merchants or the garbage pickup is paid for by the merchants of the mall. And as their, co their costs go up, so do ours, you know, because they have to recover their expenses. So um, I don't know whether, you know, I, I, don't, I don't even know where you begin to address it, but it, it, it is a concern that, um, you know, that was a concern that we, the town had when, before we converted to this new type of garbage pail was that the, the uh, staff were regularly finding, uh, and I observed, I mean, I saw cars pull up to the garbage pails on Park Road as I was oh. walking my dog and fill them full of garbage and then drive onto the ferry or whatever. Yeah, uh, but that's kind of over and above what we're talking about right now. And I, I, I think we should revisit, but I, I agree uh, that, uh, the garbage is a significant uh, factor and it will continue to run our lives uh, uh, on the Sunshine Coast. So um, in terms of the amendment, the bylaws before us, is someone prepared to recommend the first, uh, second and third reading? Council Kroll, Council D'Andrea seconded. Um, any further discussion on this? And all in favor? Okay. We'll have to have a fulsome discussion on garbage and, uh, and the management of garbage, no doubt about it. It's a, it's a significant problem. And, you know, I, and I agree, short-term rentals, uh, people taking their garbage. A lot of people take their garbage in the way of the ferry and fill out the ferry bins, uh, the ferry, or on the ferry. I've seen that happen too, so. Councilor Kroll, uh, last comment? No, it's, well, it, it is, we, it's something we don't realize. I was at the Recycle Depot on Monday and there was a lady with a pickup truck and it was full of bottles and bags of, of stuff that she was, garbage that she was dealing with and the, the bottle depot was closed. So she took her bottles to the um, Recycle Depot, which fortunately helps offset their cost of operation. But the fellow said, that's a lot of bottles. And she said, oh, I clean STRs, yeah. <laughs> and yeah. all the bottles were in Costco box in um, the Costco brand name um, boxes. So, you know, it's it just sort of makes you think that you know it is. And you know, when we look, at, I sat in on the report from the regional district last week on the the landfill and the life expectancy of the dump and. You know, I shudder to think if we ever find ourselves in a situation of having to truck our garbage off the coast, what it's going to cost us. Thank you for that. So, the final resolution is the uh, further the bylaw enforcement notice 1125-12-2021 uh, be given second and third reading as amended. Um, and the amendments will reflect the changes we made earlier. So um, somebody was to Council Kroll moved by, seconded by. Council Dean Drad, any further discussion? All in favor? 
Thank you. And thank you very much for that, Katie. We'll see this come back. I imagine next week we're final and, um, and move this one forward. So thank you very much. Uh, big project, important project though for the town. Thank you. Okay, uh, we are at the end of this agenda. Uh, we now have a motion to close. Uh, we're gonna go into in-camera session and uh, in accordance with the community charter, part of the council member will be closed. The public has subject matters to consider personal information about an identifiable individual who holds or has been considered for a position as an officer, employer, or agent of the municipality or another position appointed by the municipality labor relations or other employee relations, the acquisition, disposition, or expropriation of land or improvements, if the council considers this disclosure could be reasonably expected to harm the interest of the municipality. Somebody would like to move closure? Councilor Kroll, Councilor Ladwig, thank you. All in favor? Thank you very much. And uh, thank you to the members of the public who held on with us and, uh, and uh, shared the conversation. Um, we will Go to in camera, re reopening it sometime in the future. Okay, thank you very much. So we'll take a moment to clear the boards. Thank you. Mayor Vimish. Yes. Uh, just because there's a report received at the last minute, it's an 18 page report. I need at least 15 minutes to read. Can we come back in 15 minutes? Because I haven't read the report. I don't that's know. The, what that's the one on the, um, the uh, Kearney Ring? Yeah. yeah. Uh, sure, if, 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 if you, yep, I'm not sure it'll take that long for you to read, but uh, have a read. You don't need, the, the lease I don't think is changing.